Well, good morning. I was livelier than I thought it would be. I, yeah, good morning. Um, welcome to Central. My name is Cole, and if we haven't met, hi. It's good to see you, and good to be with everybody this morning. Uh, here at Central, we seek the transformation of our lives, our community, and the world through the renewing power of Jesus Christ. And so we want to invite you into that journey with us uh, as well. Uh, I want to say how privileged it is to be able to preach about the church. Um, I've been here for a long time and I've seen the beauty of this church and it is a wonderful thing to be able to, to speak about it um, in this way. So today we will continue our series in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 verses 4 through 8. You can find it on page 1014 in your pew Bible. And as you turn there, uh, I can't help but think when I read through a passage like this, or this one in general, but how these people were experiencing life. A people who felt increasingly as if they did not belong to the culture around them. A people who were being dismissed, shamed, and even persecuted for what they now believe. Some of them being new converts that once did feel like they belonged in the communities that they were a part of, but have heard this message of Jesus and now finding themselves at odds with all they've ever known. And in that, like us, fighting that internal struggle um, that we will face when times of hardship and fear and worry, where we try not to capitulate, where we ask that hard question whether Jesus is enough for me in good times and in the bad and everywhere in between. So this morning we are asking two main questions of this text. We're asking what is this household that Peter speaks of built on and what does it look like? How does it, in, how does it live in the world? So I wanna pray and then we will read the text together. Almighty God, give us ears to hear what you would have for us this morning. May the truth that you, Jesus, that in you, Jesus, we have a home move us and shape us, that we have a purpose in you, we have hope in you, may that encourage us, and may you challenge us where we need to change. And build us up in you, we pray. So Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be holy and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Well, our first question that we'll ask is, what is this spiritual household, this house built on? It's a really important question to ask because what we believe, what is our foundation, what is core of us, what is our identity drives how we view who God is and it drives how we live our lives in the world. When I graduated high school, this is another uh, Cole uh, story of his crazy vocations that he did all throughout. Just it's it just, the list is just never ending. But when I graduated high school, I worked construction for a summer uh, for my uncle. I worked on, an ex- on the excavating side of things, which means I helped flatten the earth for roads 
and new building projects such as subdivisions and neighborhoods. But to be honest, mostly I just dug ditches. That was my job as the lowly man, uh, as the new guy. Uh, specifically ones that needed more precise depth and precise leveling for various types of piping like cable, which I guess apparently is not much of a thing anymore, but of internet and uh, water and sewer. I was helping level and grade those, uh, putting gravel to protect it so that when the dirt would be placed on top of it, it wouldn't break the pipe, that it would be level and usable. Eventually, though, I got to do what every... I'm assuming every young toddler dreams of doing. Uh, I got to run some big machines, uh, dump trucks, bulldozers, and other cool ones. Uh, One machine, though, that I didn't really get to drive much, but it fascinated me, was this scraper. It is this massive machine with the ability to literally move hills, the earth, at large amounts it cut these big cuts in the earth to, to level it. And so you would go over it many different times, but at one, at one time of the day, you would, there would be this hill, and by the end of the day, it wasn't there anymore. And the land was being flattened and shaped, and it was taking shape. It was a cool machine. However, I did not run it. Uh, it had needed a lot more experience in order to do that that I didn't have. But I ran what was called a roller. Some of you might have seen a roller on the roads as, as they're paving and whatnot. This one was made in particular for dirt. Um, admittedly, it wasn't as cool and or powerful, but it was just as important because it continued to flatten and compact the land in order for the land to have more integrity and viability for these new builds so that when new roads or new homes came that they did not sink that, that there was a solid ground for them to be built upon, and it gave a place to start. This passage describes Jesus as a living stone, a cornerstone in which everything is built from, like a lot of land prepared where we can see the angles and the land is flat enough and the integrity of the ground is tested. The cornerstone is the basis for the construction of the whole building. One commentator defines it this way. He says, a cornerstone is not only the stone set at the corner of two intersecting walls, as the name would imply, but it is one prepared and chosen for its 90 degree angle. And so the basis, and so is the basis for the construction of the whole building. Choosing the right corner is basic, not only to the aesthetics of the building, but also to its stability and longevity. This cornerstone forms us, it guides us, it shapes us. It shapes the building, this spiritual household of God that Peter speaks of. But in it, it makes us think through big questions. Big questions like, what is shaping me? What is forming me? What is guiding me? And very pointedly, it confronts us with the decision whether we will build our house upon Jesus or to seek another way, to find our home somewhere else. And to be honest, this question is one of the most important questions that we are to ask ourselves in life. We ask it in the beginning when we are coming to faith, when everything is new and bright. And it was the same question that we ask Are we building our house on Jesus as we walk our walk with Jesus throughout all of our lives where we're checking through what is guiding me? What is shaping me? Is it my, is it the fears of the cultural moment or is it the political climate or the interaction that I had with a family member or a friend or a coworker and all of these things are those shaping us or is it Jesus? And we will see in a moment that this is not done in isolation, that the beauty of being in God's household is being with his family. And it is in relationship and community that brothers and sisters of all ages and stages help us learn more about what it means to follow Jesus if if we're humble enough to let it happen. So will we build our house on Jesus? 
when times get hard, when rejection comes, when things stall or become stale, the answer to that question bears us up in those moments. It reminds us of the immovable and unshakable household of God and his kingdom. So the group of believers that Peter is talking to, is writing to, are experiencing a profound weight of exile. Being away from home, being strangers in a strange land. Maybe you can relate to that. Whether you are here uh, or where you're from somewhere else geographically and away from all you have known, your family and your friends, whether you feel like a continual stranger in your immediate family, your friend group, your home, maybe even a stranger ideologically in your own country, your own place of work, your own friend group. There is a reality that we will experience this tension. We will experience this in our time as those who follow Jesus. And we have been reminded of who the cornerstone is and who we are and what we are build, being built up into. Dan Doriani once said, or said in his commentary, according to Peter, all that we are rests on all that Jesus is. And he is not wrong. Because in Jesus' obedience and because of his sacrifice on the cross, all the things that once separated us from God when we were unworthy are no longer true. He was worthy and precious when we weren't. And now we are called worthy and precious. Because he is chosen, we are now chosen. Because he took upon himself our sin and shame, we are now honored. In Jesus, we get this great exchange, right? That God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And it's because of Jesus that we are called children. We're no longer strangers, but chosen family, chosen to be a part of this building, this household, being built up in him, given a place at the table, a home built on this beautiful truth that Jesus loves you. And he has died for you and for me. And that the rejections of this world, while still hurt, are nowhere near as powerful as the good news and the realization that we have been chosen by the creator of all things. And that we are being built into this household for the life or or for the edification of one another and for the life of the world. We are being called to believe that Jesus is the honored one who we are now as well because of him that because he is chosen and precious we see it we are we experience it our lord bears us up when we have or bears us up in times of struggle and hardship we have no time for shame because we are children of the living god being built up into this living stone and we are strengthened we're strengthened in this, that this spiritual household is one that is unshakable, immovable, and eternal. Come what may in this world, when the winds blow, we are secure. We will not be moved because our Lord is not a dead stone. He is a living one who has conquered sin and death, who sits at the right hand of the Father Almighty and one day will come to make all things new. And this truth sets us free. It sets us free to come to him with our worry, with our fears, with our sorrow, with our hope, with our anxiety, with the assurance that he hears us and cares for us, that our righteousness does not hinge on our own spiritual resume, but on Jesus's. It frees us to live as we should in the world, to love as we should, that the world might taste and see that the Lord is good. So if he is the living stone, the cornerstone, in which all of us are living stones being built up into this house, what does this spiritual household look like? In our house, we have a picture on the wall that says, Family Rules. Now, I'm not going to pretend like it was super creative. We bought it at a store, probably like Home Goods or Hobby Lobby or Old Time Potter, one of those places 
Uh, there's a lot of good things in it, uh, but we did not create it uh, ourselves. Um, but it's this list of rules to live by as a family. Things like be thankful, be compassionate and kind, love each other, respect one another, think about others before yourself, laugh out loud, always tell the truth, dream big, and a bunch of more things, a bunch more things. And the reality is that a lot of these are really great, and they are lived out. The problem, though, is, well, one of the issues I have with it is that the most challenging things, the one that take the most humility, the truest humility, are like in this really small font, and like italicized, like almost like these are optional, potentially, or when you get around to it, love one another kind of thing. It's, it's, it's a little odd. Um, but these types of signs or these types of reminders aren't uncommon. You drive in neighborhoods, you see stakes in the ground that says, this is who we are. We have things on our doors, things on our walls, things that we write about who we want to be. That is, that is who we are. We have aspirations to be people who are good, who do things how we're supposed to do. But the problem is, is that oftentimes these lists become overwhelming and what they end up becoming is just a list of, or just checklists rather than something to embody or to become. We forget who we are being built into because we forget who is building us. See, the church is made up of these living stones being built off the righteousness and grace found in Jesus. We're striving to be these things and more, not not merely just to follow a list of rules, but an embodied presence, an identity guided by the Holy Spirit. It is important that we are aware of how the language here is formed. The only individual or single descriptions in this passage are of Jesus. The rest are plural. This construction is not one of isolation or individual effort. It is a community. It is a collective. Karen Jobes, in her description of this, says, Notably, these living stones are not lying about in idle isolation or disorder in Peter's description. They are not heaped in a pile or scattered across a field. Christians are not individually temples of God in the image that Peter presents here. The imagery of the living stones being built into a single unit implies that the significance and purpose of the individual Christian cannot be realized apart from community with other believers. It is who we are, it is what we are about. We need one another. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the church being the body, and as an illustration, then after that follows, what does this body even look like? We, are, we have these lists, we have these ways of living, because it's important to figure out who we are and what this com- these communities are to look like. So what are they supposed to look like? Well, the word that Peter uses for household here is oikos, and it's not the yogurt, um, although that is a very good yogurt brand, just saying. Not product placement, not getting paid, but it's good. Um, Peter is using this pretty common word used for home to have this double meaning here, that it's both a temple and a home. Describing both the church's purpose as a place of spiritual importance, a temple, and a family, a home. He also describes those who dwell in this house as a holy priesthood, who offer up spiritual sacrifices through Jesus. We are his temple, his people, these living stones. We are called a holy priesthood, plural, not merely individual. There are, not, uh, there are not a bunch of stones thrown around all over the place, but we are unified to show, that the world, show the world through the way we worship and live together the validity of God's house and our Savior Jesus Christ. We offer up cruciform lives lived, as sin- lives lived with Jesus at the center of the core of our being. We're relying on his work for us in his life, death, and resurrection that we have been redeemed and brought into this family and give thanks at the core of who we are. And it's because of his ascension that we have this high priest who advocates for us and who has sent us back in as priests into this community and to the world, bringing life in a culture of death, 
showing grace in a culture of vitriol and welcoming in a time of exclusion. It is where we offer spiritual sacrifices of what God has done in our lives. It's not only about spreading the gospel message and the saving faith of Jesus, while also in just integral and very important, it's also about proclaiming what he has done in the world and for us and in us and through us. The church is the mediation of the gospel in the world. How we speak about it and how we live within it matters. We are priests in the household of God with Jesus as our great high priest. We are offering up the beauty of the body of Christ for the world to see and for the edification and the growth of one another. For Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples by the way in which you love one another. This love is work, but it is beautiful. Because we are reminded that in accepting the Redeemer, it also means that we accept those whom he has redeemed. In a world of division and polarization, a world where we seek to find reasons why not to, or you don't fully belong. The church is to be a refuge, a beacon of hope, a light in the storms of life. We are also, though, a family. Not only are we a temple and priests within, we are together as a house, a home. In this proclamation of the gospel, as we worship together, we are a unified family because coming to Christ means coming into relationship with others not only in one's own generation, but also by, be, by being united with believers of every generation, who likewise have been built into God's grand building project. We are made up of young and old, those with varying cognitive abilities and physical abilities, married and single, those with children and those who are, uh, and those who are spiritual mothers, fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers, aunts, uncles, those who come from different high schools, just letting you know, it's true. <laughs> Those who come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different places of hurt, places of joy. We need each other. We need our stories because that is what is building us up together. It each brings something to the table. And in a world that seeks to section people off, to categorize people here and there, and I'm guilty of it too, as, as you may be as well. We are to show, be showing what it looks like to be this household as we teach one another through study and sharing of God's word, through the conduct of our lives as we bear with one another's burdens, as we pray for one another, as we weep with each other in times of sorrow, as we rejoice in times of joy, where repentance and forgiveness are found where being patient and humble with one another is the norm because we are all in process, we are all growing, we are all being built up. It is a community where the blessing of God, blessings of God are spoken over one another, where we come to the Lord's table, where we celebrate what God has done in remembering and receive strength to help one another. Imagine a world new. Imagine a world made new and to live in light of that beautiful promise as we go out into the world secure in the knowledge that this household, because of Jesus, is unshakable. This is who we are. This is our identity and our purpose as redeemed people, living stones, a part of the spiritual household of God. We are a family loved by God as we offer other people a refuge in a world that can, can and does reject Jesus, in a world that feels increasingly not like home, we are offering other broken exiles hope and healing as we too are being built up into this house together. I wanna end with, um, with just an encouragement. And it might sound simple, and that's kind of the point. Let's be the church. Let's be this spiritual household. Our neighbors need to see how a church responds in divisive times with unity and grace. The world needs to see the church guide one another through these polarizing times together. 
knowing full well that difference exists in this place, but that we have more in common with our brother and sister in Christ than any other thing that is either subtly or explicitly calling you to build your life upon it. That our pe- we are a people marked by hope and not cynicism because we know the end of the story. But if we are honest, that is done often through very ordinary things. Because at the end of the day, we are humans and we need human stuff. We need to eat. We need friends. We need family. And so go invest in one another's lives through events and studies, through shared meals and experiences. Go to a church picnic. Invite someone to dinner. Offer to pray for someone. Hear their story. Understand them. See them. Encourage one another. Because when we feel rejected, when we feel like things are falling apart, when we feel like things are shaky at its core, we need to be reminded that Jesus is our cornerstone. We need to be reminded that it's his people who dwell in this house and that together we do this. That we are not isolated living stones hanging out by ourselves. We are a part of this great building project with Jesus as the cornerstone. We are to be a community of light and love built up in Jesus for the life of the world. Hoping and praying that this world might see, that this world might taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful um, for this beautiful news that we are yours, that we are your family, that we are at your temple, that you are strong enough, you are good enough to build our lives upon. Lord, keep us from wavering in this way and that way. Keep us together as we walk this journey together. May we glorify you in the midst of that and may the world see as we are embodying this beautiful gospel, may the world see your goodness and may they come to you. Strengthen us, we pray. And it's in Jesus' name, amen.